shines on everyone. Yes, it does. There's a million stars. Each for the one every city. Welcome to this edition of Cops Corner. I'm Officer James with the Urbana Police Department, and today we have a special guest. We have Julia Reitz from the Champaign County uh, State's Attorney's Office. Welcome, Julia. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, would you prefer me to call you Julia or Your Honor? You know, no, not how, how your would honor. you? <laughs> um, the formal title that people call me is mm -hmm. Madam State's Attorney. Madam State. Um, okay. But you don't have to call me Madam State's Attorney. We've known each other long enough. Oh, okay. So Ju Julia. Julia will work. Okay. Absolutely. For for the purpose of the the interview, Julia is going to be her name today. So, okay, Julia. So we, we've spoke before um, when I was trying to get you on the show. Uh, we want to kind of talk a little bit about cause and effect. You know, um, when a person in our community commits a crime, um, is there a set um, like punishment for each crime or does it kind of depend on their history? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I think that the decision of whether or not to file criminal charges and what charges to file is the most important point of the criminal justice process. Mm -hmm. And it's for the prosecutor to decide. It's not for the victim. Uh, we get a lot of victims, particularly domestic violence right. victims, who come into our office or who um, may say to the officer on the street, I don't want charges to be filed right. or I want to drop charges. But it's the prosecutor who makes that decision. And it's not the police officer either. Right. You, know, you on the street may make an arrest and you have to say, um, I'm arresting this person for this particular charge mm. so that when they go to the jail, the jail knows what bond to set. Right. Um, but the state's attorney's office then receives your report and reviews it, and we can agree with you, or we could not agree with you. We could think that uh, the charges should be stronger, or we should go with a lower class of offense, or no charges at all. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that we're suggesting that the police officer was wrong. The police officer has a different burden of proof and different requirements out there on the street. Um, public safety is an issue. Absolutely. The police officer has to make a decision based on a lower level of evidence, probable cause. Mm -hmm. But we, as the prosecutor, have to make our charging decision based on whether we can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. And so sometimes we might decline to file charges after a, an arrest. That doesn't mean that we're saying the officer was wrong in the first place. Right. So to me, that point where we receive the investigation, we the prosecutor, and make that decision is the most important point in the criminal justice process because we are then putting somebody into the system. Right. And how we choose to do that, uh, whether it's through a felony or a misdemeanor, can have such a great impact on that individual as well as on the victim and the community um, and the entire process. So we take that point very seriously. Um, the laws are written by the legislators over in Springfield. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who decide what's a crime and what class of a crime it is and what the potential penalties are. Right. All crimes have a range of potential penalties. Mm -hmm. And a lot of different things that you can do, as you know, could be called a variety of different things. Um, the example that I use all the time when I speak to students at high schools is I call it the Sammy the Steak Stealer example. Okay. Okay, so Sammy, it's a hot July day, and Sammy is um, going to have a barbecue, have some people over. So Sammy puts on a big baggy coat with lots of pockets, right. and you've probably investigated this Absolutely. a number of times. Absolutely, in the right? summer, right? The big coat, something's yeah. not right there. Big coat, no wallet, goes to the schnooks in Urbana mm. and goes right to the meat department and puts some steaks and you know whatever else Pork in the pockets. And whatever, right. Maybe goes to the liquor department mm. and gets a bottle of tequila or something, mm. goes right past and doesn't pay for it and walks out the door. And you know there's cameras everywhere, Correct. so the store security officer goes out, gets Sammy, calls Urbana, and you right. go out and you make an arrest. Now you know that under the law, you could arrest Sammy for burglary. Burglary, right. Right. Because he went in with the intent to mm -hmm. deprive. Yeah. And right. so what I do when I talk to students is I ask them, here's what the law says in Illinois. In Illinois, a burglary is entering a building with the com intention to commit a theft. Mm -hmm. And it is a class two felony. Mm -hmm. Three to seven years incarceration in the Illinois Department of Corrections. 
So, so let's, let's pause right there for a minute. <laughs> mm -hmm. Three to seven years for going in to take some steaks mm -hmm. that you want to grill for that day. Yeah. You'll probably waste half of them. <laughs> take some Jose mm -hmm. Cuevo or, or some, some, you know, mm -hmm. Don Julio and not pay for it where you probably could have right. antied up money and just go mm -hmm. and, and buy it at the time. Yeah, because if I can prove that you entered that building with the intent to commit a theft, mm -hmm. then I could, under the law in Illinois, charge that burglary. And so then I talk, what are the elements of the offense? What right. is, what, how do I show that intent? Um, the fact that you had the big baggy coat with the pockets and no wallet and went right to the meat department. It's hot outside. It's hot outside, right. exactly. That's why I say July. Um, mm -hmm. And so we talk about that. What, what else could we charge that person with? We could mm -hmm. also charge them with a misdemeanor, misdemeanor theft. Right, retail theft. Right. Or so you, theft is defined as taking something that doesn't belong to you with the intent to deprive the owner of the use of that property. Right. And certainly we have the elements of that offense there. So you as the officer could show up and arrest Sammy for a burglary, right. and then Sammy sits in jail overnight and we get the report in the morning. Mm -hmm. We're gonna look at it then, and then we, the prosecutor, has to make a decision. Do we charge Sammy with a burglary, a felony, where if Sammy's convicted, Sammy can't legally own a gun, can't get certain jobs in the healthcare field, that sort of thing, very difficult. Sammy, if Sammy's convicted of a felony, can legally vote in Illinois. Right. And I always want to make sure people understand that, that convicted felons are allowed to vote in Illinois. But there's lots of things, obviously, as a convicted felon that limit you. Right. It hinders your right. process mm -hmm. from that point on. Right. Or I could charge Sammy with a misdemeanor, right. which doesn't carry all of that weight and all of that burden. Um, but why, you know, why would I might what other things am I going to look at when I'm making that decision? Mm -hmm. So then, again, when I'm talking with the students, we have a conversation about what other factors might we be looking at. Prior history is a big one. Right. You know, let's say Sammy is somebody who's never been in the criminal justice system before. Right. We should give Sammy an opportunity, that lower level offense, or maybe even a diversion program. Right, which or, they, they, the street would call it a break. Yeah, right. or you as the officer could write a city ordinance ticket. Correct. Because right. the city has, you can make that decision on the street mm -hmm. level as well. But what if Sammy has been in and out of the criminal justice system? What if Sammy's on parole? What right. if Sammy you know, has had opportunities at probation before and we're just tired of it? It's sort of like with your kids, right? right? You know, there's a certain point where you start out with a, you know, don't do that again, right. and a, then a maybe you send them to their tongue room. Tongue lashing, right. You know, maybe you take their phone away if you can mm. do that, you know, but the punishments ramp up. Right. And it's the same, again, in the criminal justice system. So we're looking at prior history. Maybe we're looking at how Sammy responded. You know, mm. did Sammy confess? Was Sammy sorry and apologetic, or did Sammy you know, punch the security officer and run away from you and require, you know, you to go on a chase and put everybody in danger. Right. Th that, that was, those were some excellent points. There was two things that you spoke about that I wanted to kind of mm -hmm. cover again. I'll cover the most recent one okay. first. Um, how you react once you commit the offense. You've mm -hmm. already messed up, right? You've already committed this, this crime. You already stole the item or, or damaged the property. Um, so it does play a factor mm -hmm. if they fess up tell the truth, um, it doesn't have to be pulled out of them, you know, it does right. play a factor, correct? Oh, absolutely. And also, you know, how you react, whether you did it or whether you didn't do it, mm -hmm. can, you know, we talk about making a mountain out of a molehill. You know, right. there's been so many times where I've read reports or maybe you've been in situations where you just think, this was a little thing, and you turned it into this giant situation. Absolutely, you know, I know all about that. If those. you have to chase somebody mm -hmm. and you hurt yourself, you know, or an mm -hmm. officer gets hurt in the process, then that becomes a felony, aggravated resisting. Right. You know, and so people, e even if they truly believe that they're in the right and the officer's in the wrong, the best way to respond to that, to handle that situation, is to be cooperative, right. to be polite and respectful, and then deal with it through a complaint system or through the criminal justice system in court, um, but not to make what might be a 
minor or bad situation even worse. Into a major situation, yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to look at that as well in how we're making decisions. Um, and we're also going to look at the person's life issues. You know, mm -hmm. we see in our, in our system a lot of people who have um, substance abuse problems, right. who have mental health issues, who might have financial or economic circumstances right. that uh, create issues for them. And we do take all of that into account. You know, sometimes I'll switch it up and say, maybe Sammy's not stealing steaks, maybe Sammy's stealing baby food. Right. You know. Right. But then I'll say, well, what if Sammy doesn't have any children, but Sammy's selling the baby food out on the street? Right. You know, those are all factors that we're going to look at when we're making that decision. So, so it's not just, okay, um, Johnny A stole the same items that Johnny B stole, and they both you know, supposed to get the same crime or same punishment, mm -hmm. even if Johnny B has had prior contacts with the police or has stolen, right. has been convicted of, of theft from Walmart, Myers, mm -hmm. been banned from all these different places, that, that's going to play a factor in, in the charging. Yeah, because no two people or no two situations are exactly alike. We right. try to be as consistent as we possibly can. But those legislators over in Springfield decided that we should have what we call prosecutorial discretion. Mm -hmm. you know, now, that can be difficult because I'm a politician. I'm an elected official. Right. You know, and it might be easy for me as a politician to say, I'm going to charge everything as hard as I can. You know, if you commit a crime, you're going to prison. Right. Um, that might be politically in some arenas a good way to go. But right. personally, that's not my philosophy. I believe that um, we need to hold those who endanger our community accountable for their actions. Absolutely. But we also need to give people an opportunity to um, be rehabilitated, to take responsibility, to move forward, and to be productive members of our community. So we have to use that discretion wisely. Sometimes we need to bring down the hammer. You know, Absolutely. Sometimes you've given people opportunities or they've hurt somebody, they are a danger to our community. In those cases, we need to be strong. Right. But other times, we need to give people a chance. Um, Absolutely. And we try to do that every day. Yeah. Now, um, and them people endangering our community, that's an excellent point, excellent segue into our next uh, topic. Mm -hmm. um, people were out here using guns, using um, weapons to, to harm and, and threaten and, and uh, intimidate our communities. Um, and there's Champaign, because before we go into that, you, you're, you're in charge of everything in Champaign County, correct? Like right. everything comes through you. Yes. So uh, all of the, the larger towns would be Champaign, Urbana, Rant, Rantoul. Right. Um, you know, those, Muhammad would, yeah. would fall into mm -hmm. that. Um, that's, that's, those are the, pretty much the, the major right. ones, right, in our area. Um, so. Yeah, Illinois is divided up into 102 counties, mm -hmm. and each county has an elected state's attorney. So my jurisdiction is all of Champaign County. Right. Uh, we're about a 200,000 population, with so the large cities being Urbana and Champaign, Rantoul, um, campus, right. sort of its own city in a way, right. um, Muhammad. And so it's a varied um, community. We have a lot of different issues going on, um, but we all share concern about public safety, right. absolutely. So, so back to the gun, uh, people toting guns. I, I've, uh, we'll talk about the, the internet mm -hmm. and the gun situation at first. I, I spoke at Novak yesterday, mm -hmm. um, Novak Academy over there in uh, Champaign, to a group of uh, high school students. They're, they're at the verge of graduating. Um, and we spoke about social media. Um, one of the things that, that came up was about people posting guns, you know, mm -hmm. them pointing guns at the camera, talking about what, what their crew is going to do and, and having uh, a, a couple ounces of weed in, the, in, mm -hmm. the, in the, the video. Those charges can be brought on them, if, if I'm correct, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, if, we, if we can link somebody with something that we find on social media and with 
um, actual evidence to support that, um, we're going to use that as a piece of evidence. Right. Um, I don't want to say that in the sense of you know hoping right. that people stop find. doing right. it, absolutely. but it's out there and it absolutely is a tool. The other thing about social media that we see a lot is um, that people use it as a way to communicate negatively. Right. You know, there's a lot of threats, there's a lot of garbage out there on social media that is ramping up a lot of the violence we see in our community. Um, right. and the drama and people just, you know, really need to take a step back away from some of that drama and violence that they might uh, be caught up in, as particularly juveniles. I spend a lot of my time in juvenile court, mm -hmm. and a lot of the situations that we see um, those young people getting into really start on a social media level. Right. Yeah, it's, it's social media is something else now. We didn't have that when, when we <laughs> no. were growing up. It was different, you know, we, we, we had to hear it hearsay you know, mm -hmm. from uh, people on the block, so to speak. Um, the, th this, this gun violence we've had, if, if I remember correctly, um, and I may be a little off now because I've, I've been out of the meeting loop for a couple weeks, we had a hundred and, was it 17 um, shots fired right. calls where we had actual physical mm -hmm. evidence? Yes. And, and, I mean, these bullets can land, I mean, they, they can hit anybody. They don't, you can't aim them and, I mean, and direct them to say, okay, oh, I'm going to go around okay. this person. You know, if, if, if you are a person out there, if you have a, having beef with another person, and you're, you see them and you just start shooting, if it hits somebody else. You are as guilty of murder right. if you hit somebody you didn't intend to hit as you are if you hit the person you meant to hit. Right. Um, that's called transferred intent. Right. So if you hit an innocent bystander, you are just as guilty of murder if that person dies or um, whatever other offense it could possibly be. Yeah, there, there's no, oh man, oops. Nope. There you know, are, there's no there oops. There is no oops in gun you know, violence. You, Absolutely you, not. You put the guns mm -hmm. down. You know I mean, that, that's what, yeah. I know you was on the radio uh, several months mm -hmm. back um, on 105.5 and you did a um, thing talking about putting the guns down. Yeah. And um, it, to me, it, it went over very well. I think that young people don't realize the, the implications of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that they get caught up in this social media stuff, in, in this um, group think, mm -hmm. um, in this I've got to stand up for, you know, my friend or my relative, I, this perceived you know, disrespect that somebody else got or whatever, they get all caught up in it. Right. And, you know, I see it in juvenile court all the time. Young people saying, oh, I'm carrying a gun for protection or, you know, and I think they just don't understand the implications because when we catch them and they come into court, I'm always shocked by the fact that when the judge sits up there and tells them, you could be looking at five to 15 years in prison for this offense. Right. You know, that sometimes they start crying. Right. Because I think they just don't realize the, the implications of what they're doing and the consequences. They let their emotions get mm -hmm. the best of them at the time and their pride. Or they think that they're not going to get caught. Right. You know, they're going to get caught. And when they get caught, we're going to deal with it harshly. You know, right. just yesterday, I was in court with a juvenile who was sentenced to the Department of Juvenile Justice mm -hmm. for possession of a weapon. Right. You know, and I think young people need to understand that we are not going to take these cases lightly um, because they are endangering themselves and they're endangering everyone around them. Whether they intend to endanger, you know, a specific person or right. not, they, right. they are truly putting all of us in danger and we're just not going to take it lightly. Right. Make sure you hear that, <laughs> telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, let's say you just have a gun and you're, and you're a juvenile. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we're considered a juvenile between 13 and, and let's say 18, right? Right. Um, 17, In Illinois, 13. the law is um, under 18. You're considered mm -hmm. a juvenile, so you'd be handled generally in juvenile court. In juvenile court. So let's say they just have a gun. Mm -hmm. they, they just possess a gun. What, what, what type of time would that hold if, if it's, let's just say, a first-time offender? So a first, and that's important because there's a lot of, um, with, same with the theft laws that we talked mm -hmm. about. When it comes to gun laws, 
the potential penalties depend a lot on the circumstances, both of how you're carrying it, where you're carrying it, and what your prior history is. Right. If you're an adult and you have um, a certain type and number of prior offenses, just the possession of that gun, and it can be completely unloaded, can be a class X felony, six to 30 years at 85%. Right. That's called armed habitual criminal. Um, if you're a prior convicted felon, it's a you know, mandatory prison term, three to 14 years. If you're a juvenile and you've been in juvenile court before, mm -hmm. um, then again, you can be, the, the charges can be um, increased and it can be a class three or four felony. So one to three or two to five years potential incarceration. If you're a juvenile, they can hold you in the juvenile department of corrections um, up until you're 21. Um, and so a lot of that depends on your age. There have been some changes in the law that um, we used to, there used to be some offenses that were mandatory transfers from juvenile court to adult court. Mm -hmm. So if you shot somebody, if you, um, that was a mandatory transfer to adult court. Now, as of January 1st, the law has changed and it's a discretionary transfer. We have to ask the judge to make a ruling on that. Okay. But I will say, you know, that we will always file that motion and Absolutely. ask for that transfer. Right. Um, because again, if you're going to use a gun out in public and you're, you know, a young person, you're acting an adult. Right, absolutely. You're putting yourself in an adult, in an adult, adult shoes, right. situation. Um, and they, young people need to understand that, again, that this is not a situation we're going to take lightly. Right. Um, we want to give people the opportunity to move forward, um, but right now we just can't um, sit back and look lightly at, at gun violence in our community. Not at all, not at all. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest things. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to jump right into mm -hmm. that earlier today. I want to kind of talk about some other things, but the gun, the gun situation in our community is just is, is out of control. Um, people in, in our community, I hear it all, all the time. I mean, they're just they're fed up. Mm -hmm. they're, they're afraid and, and a bullet can come through their window. You know, at any time from somebody just being in their feelings. Right. Um, so j just to kind of recap um, the gun part, even, even if you happen to have a friend that, that has a stolen gun, you, you're on you know, YouTube, Snapchat, mm -hmm. Twitter, Kink, whatever, um, holding the gun, playing with the gun, you know, you, you're, you don't have a, a Foy, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're, you're, you're not a um, uh, concealed carry, you know, uh, license right. holder. Um, and, and, you know, it could be found to be a mm -hmm. stolen gun. You, you, you could be facing charges. Absolutely. You know, it, it, just, just being, thinking that you're being cool. Absolutely. Right? Or you get in a car and there's a gun in that car. Let's say you sit down and the gun's on the floorboard by your feet. That's your gun. Absolutely. You can be charged with possession of that gun even if you're not the one who put it in the car. And that goes for guns, drugs Absolutely. as well, right? Mm -hmm. weed, weed, I know people, you know, talk about, oh, weed ain't never hurt nobody, but weed's still illegal. Oh, yeah. You know, unless you got a, a prescription for mm -hmm. it and, and, and you have a, um, what it's like a certain type of marijuana they right. give now. Right, if you have a certain, under new Illinois law, mm -hmm. um, medical marijuana is, um, is a new Illinois law. Mm -hmm. And so if you have certain types of illnesses, very specific illnesses, mm -hmm. and you get a prescription from a doctor and fill it at a licensed facility with a certain type of cannabis that right. you only possess a certain amount of, then it's legal. Other than that, cannabis continues to be illegal to possess in Illinois. Right. Um, and very importantly, what we're most concerned about is um, driving while well impaired by cannabis. Yes. Um, it is absolutely a DUI, same it, as an alcohol down, DUI, right. if you drive when you are impaired after smoking cannabis. Right. We see that all the time. Um, and people, I think, are under this impression that it's not a crime, but it absolutely is. And um, it, you, you will be held accountable you know, just as, strong, as strictly. Over at the U of I Police Department, they have an officer who's specifically trained in doing field sobriety tests just for cannabis. I saw that on the news. And right. I'm hoping that we're going to increase that, um, that other officers are going to take that training and be um, able to help us in those cases because you are just as dangerous if you are impaired by cannabis as you are if you're impaired by alcohol. Because it's the impairment. Right. It's, it's not necessarily the 
item in which you impaired yourself with. Right. It, it's the impairment that, that's illegal and puts you, well, the use of the drugs illegal mm -hmm. too, but the, it's, that's what puts you in danger. That's what right. puts other people in danger, the impairment. Yes. Um, so, okay, kids, don't do drugs. Um, Julia, is there anything that, that we haven't covered today that you think that our public uh, needs to know? Well, I think that this is a great opportunity for um, the public to hear from law enforcement, prosecutors, your guests, um, hopefully to understand the complexities that uh, we face in our jobs, right. um, to understand our concern for what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis out in the community. I want people to feel that they can reach out to us, ask us questions, trust us, um, question us, right. you know, ask us why we do the things that we do. Absolutely. Um, because only if there is that trust and that communication can we all work together to solve some of these issues that we've discussed. Now, there's a process in which they would need to do, right? Mm -hmm. they, you know, either, they, and they, is there a general email that, that we can put across the bottom of the screen or mm -hmm. um, should they come to the state's attorney's office and try to make an appointment or what, what I do you do have I do have a there is a state's attorney's office website okay. um, and so definitely people can go to that there's some good questions answers available on the website I'm always trying to add additional information um, I have a Facebook office Facebook page Champaign okay. County State's Attorney's Office and I try to put information about uh, certain cases and changes in the law um, and maybe, you know, good things that law enforcement does. I think it's really important to highlight um, some of the great work that our law enforcement does um, here in our community. And so you're welcome to check out my Facebook page, send me a message there, um, send me an email at our office email address with questions. I try to be as absolutely respons responsive as I can. That's excellent, Julie. Well, I, I definitely I appreciate your time for you coming on and sharing with our uh, community. Um, so, as always, uh, we appreciate you watching this episode of Cops Corner. And if you do have any other questions that you want to have asked of uh, State's Attorney Reese, you can email me at the email below, and I will either respond to them via the email or have uh, State's Attorney Reese back on to answer some of those questions. Thank you for watching, and be safe.